I've seen some other videos on YouTube where they say this tone is horrible and it doesn't fit. And in my opinion, I see the true artistry in that. I love that back in this time period, I think a lot of these guys stumbled upon their tones very organically, which have become classics and it's influenced so many of us. <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome back to Lone University. Today, we're putting the spotlight on the late Chris Squire of Yes. We're going to be listening to and watching a live performance of Roundabout from 1991 on the band's Union Tour, which I had no idea this happened, but a bunch of ex-members came back and some of these offshoot Yes groups came back and did sort of a reunion. We have two drummers. We have Alan White and Bill Bruford, and I've never seen this. So I'm excited to check it out. But Roundabout is from their classic album. It's their fourth album from 1971 called Fragile. I want to talk about all the great things Chris Squire contributed to Yes and their sound and some cool stories at the end because I played with Yes on two separate occasions with Scale the Summit and those were some of the biggest shows I've ever played and I got a lot of unique perspective on the band and uh, kind of seeing them during the, these later days but nonetheless let's jump in roundabout from Yes. It's a heck of an ensemble. This is an iconic rock intro, most recognizable. Woo. Intense. You know, Yes had such a big sound with just the four of them. Now we have multiple drummers and such. That freaking tone. John Anderson, angelic. Okay, real quick, Chris Squire's live tone sounds just like the record. Now, of course, I'm sure this was mixed in post-production and such, but oftentimes I hear a really great bass tone on a record. When I check the band out live, it's like completely different or like a not as good version. So this, this sounds exactly like it. He's got this tone nailed in. I want to point out something about this bass line. For many years, I was playing it wrong, and you might be too. It's obviously a great contrapuntal melody to what Steve Howe's doing on the guitar, which we'll get into as well. But normally, I was playing the bass line like this a lot of the time with kind of this everything on the downbeat, no pickup notes. And I later learned that there's an actual pickup note on the E of three, so three E and uh, I'm sorry, the of three, three E and uh. We add that open A string, and it adds an entire different bounce and feel to the riff. So the wrong way, which I was playing it, versus that open A string, that little pickup on the of three completely changes the bounce and feel of the riff. So if you've been playing it wrong, like I did for so long, this is how you play it. Let's keep going. Bill Bruford, it's amazing, and Alan White. You can hear that pickup. Important. That chord right there always has fascinated me from a music theory perspective. There's a couple different ways it could be interpreted. So we're in the key of E minor right now. There's no F natural in that. And they're going to a G dominant seven chord. So that is technically a key change in a way, which actually would put it in the key of C major, coming from E minor, which is in the key of G major. Not to get too heady, but I love the way they land on that F out of key. In the key of E minor, it's E and F sharp and G. There's no F natural. So them landing on that F foreshadows that upcoming key change, which gives it that dominant feel. Sometimes I feel like this chord could function as a secondary dominant. I'm not sure if it really upholds that right here. A secondary dominant means you just take a chord and make it a dominant. So if we take a G major chord, we turn it to dominant. It now has a new function into a different key, which would be C major. 
So if we go back and listen to that chord, you'll notice that tension that it kind of brings to the sound of the line. Very E minor. Even if you don't have a very musical ear, you can kind of hear that that adds a little bit of color and tension to the, the whole tonality of the line. And I find it really fascinating. It's a great compositional tool to bring them into this more bluesy G dominant part. I've always really loved that. So now it's a more blues dominant feel. Love it. That tone, grinding. Now we're back to the darker E minor sound. And one of the hallmarks of Chris Squire's bass playing is the contrapuntal, the contrapuntal, that's a tough word to say, which just means of counterpoint, nature of his lines are always very melodic. And I talk about this in a lot of the videos here on the channel when bass players stray away and have their own melody that supports another melody or the lead melody. In this sense, the melody is kind of started with Steve Howe on the guitar. It's a very simple melody. Um, <laughs> simple that starts with the harmonics it's a very interesting way of playing that melody it has a very unique sound harmonics just being those so chris squire's bass line is a very famous rock bass line one of the most recognizable bass lines it kind of starts out following that so and then it adds a little tag that kind of gives it some rhythm that goes with the drum parts bill bruford is playing And I love that. That is like counterpoint in essence. It's a it's two different melodies happening at the same time that sort of support each other and complement and ebb and flow off of each other. It's a brilliant bass line that is often overlooked, but I really like the, the way it functions in the melody here. Here's that chord again. He's basically walking it down a G mixolydian scale. That flat seven basically puts us in the key of C major. So it's just a very smooth way of doing that. That's kind of a very hallmark sound of this piece. Grinding under it. God, this is a hell of a John Anderson performance. Great. It's like a heavy riff. Look at that shot right there. That is a heck of a stage setup. And man, I would be trip. I would be scared to trip on a cable or something. There's, they're kind of walking around all over. Uh, that, that it's just. I would have loved to see this. It's really cool. Two drummers is can be tough to pull off. And with this kind of song and all the feel and kind of tempo change that kind of fluctuates, it's really interesting how they're keeping it all together. I want to make a note about Chris Squire's tone. I've seen some other videos on YouTube where they say this tone is horrible and it doesn't fit. And in my opinion, I see the true artistry in that. You know, this was an era, the late 60s, early 70s. There wasn't YouTube, and there was a, a couple articles maybe in magazines about what pedals people used. I found that there was so much identity from those players back then is because they spent the time finding their tones sort of in a vacuum. They didn't 
look up on YouTube to see how this guy got this sound. We're kind of in this tutorial age now where everything's very easily accessed, immediate gratification, and it's really great because it is, I think, influenced music to be as diverse as ever. But I love that, you know, hypothetically, Chris Squire stumbled upon this tone and was like, that's good enough for me. And there wasn't any fact checking your sound, whether it works, whether someone else is doing it. You know, there's an entire other video that could be made on what he's using. I know he split his pickup signal to put the trebly pickup into a guitar amp, the lower pickup or the neck pickup into a bass amp. And I'm sure some of you would know exactly how that's done. I even read that Chris Squire preferred a lot of fret buzz, which a lot of people don't like. He, it, it, it's the artistry of it. It's like, this is the sound I want. This is the sound that works. And this is the sound Yes has become known for. Takeaway here is find your own tone. Don't worry about what someone else is doing. If it sounds good to you and it works for your music, it should stop there. And I, I love that back in this time period, I think a lot of these guys stumbled upon their tones very organically, which have become classics and it's influenced so many of us. I just, I think about this a lot. <laughs> I had a feeling they were going to do this. They were going to kind of beef up some of the album parts. There's there's the hands there to do it. We have multiple uh, keyboardists, multiple guitar players, uh, um, these harmonies. It's really, really cool. And to go back and catch that, they're kind of doubling with a lower octave on that progression. Oh, that's beefy. That was cool. I want to go back and see where he puts his hand there. Let's see. Talking about Chris. He's picking a little closer to the neck pickup here. When the, the video started, he was kind of picking more down here by the bridge. You can get completely different tones just by moving your hand a couple inches. Down here, it's going to be a lot more thinner and more punchy and immediate. Turn my volume up. That would help, right? Whereas if you pick up here... So you can completely change your tone just six inches away. The tension raises as you get closer to this point or this point. So you can completely change your tone. No pedals, no EQ, just where you put your hand. And he's kind of switching between those positions, I find, for the more melodic parts. He's kind of playing a little closer to the neck pickup. It's a more rounder, subdued sound. It seems like when he's playing that main iconic bass riff, he's a little further down by the bridge. So that's like very seasoned player stuff to know where you can just change the tone simply by where your hand is. It's very important and an overlooked part of bass playing. So much going on. Love how they bring that melody back over a different section. Very cool. Ending on the five. This part is so ethereal. Just that organ. I love how he's changing it up. Nice live ad lib there. There's so many notes happening in that keyboard part, but the tone he's choosing, the way it's kind of slurring it, you don't hear it. You just hear this kind of like ebbing and flowing, again, ethereal sound that complements that guitar, which is a little bit more staccato. I just love the contrast. Come out of the sky 
Yeah, I know these out of key notes here, not out of key in a bad way. I've seen that comment before. They are chain, they are pulling notes from a different key. Obviously, we're in E minor still, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C, D, E. They're putting a B flat in here and an E flat in here. You know why? It, it's just maybe it just sounded good, but I find it interesting the way it kind of functions musically. So we start back on this G major here. Going to that B flat, uh, it's it's kind of going to F major. What I find really interesting too is this E flat here that it hangs on. There's using some common common tone modulation where in an E flat major chord, E flat G and B. A great way to transition to a different key is to use common tone modulation. That means if you're playing a chord, if you go to another chord that shares one note it can sound a lot more natural to your ear. Whether it makes sense or not, it's just a great way to smoothly transition with the least amount of knee-jerk tension possible. So if we hang on this E-flat chord here. E-flat. E-flat major. It shares a G with the following chord when it goes back to this G dominant sound. Listen, so hanging on this E-flat major, let me go back a few frames. E flat major shares that G, so when we go back to the G, it somehow sounds a little natural. This is really clever stuff that, you know, maybe artists do this because it just sounds good, or maybe they did it because they know this. Either way, the end result is the same. It has a very natural sounding transition. We're back to that same bluesy feel. There's some of that same stuff happening here. Look at how he's jumping around like that. They're all running around. I again, I would be so scared to trip over something on the stage. They're packed in there. Like that that's a bold run. Just start running like that. Man, I would I feel like I would knock a keyboard over. Ooh, harmonizing that. That's not on the record. I don't think it is. Woo. Back to the original key. This is a great mix. Everything's very clear. If I haven't said it, yes, this is just quintessential Rickenbacker tone. Chris Squire was known for using the Rickenbacker. I, th I think he popularized it. Later, Getty Lee played it, Cliff Burton, you name it. There's probably guys that played one before him. I don't know if John Entwistle did, but I know Chris Squire had some influence from John and the Who. They kind of came around the same period of time. I still think Chris Squire pioneered so much about modern electric bass. It's also worth noting here that this section has some Scottish country dance influence. This is right off of their Wikipedia page where some members have said they were inspired by reels, a reel just being a Scottish country dance once again. Again, the geographical imprint on this band's sound in that time period in the UK, and it adds a very jovial feel to this song that starts off very dark and minor and mystical. We kind of have this AB back and forth that keeps it in this jovial spirit and really, you know, depicts going through the countryside in that era. Really interesting. You see, he's playing over the neck pickup there, probably for that fatter tone as he's picking faster. You kind of want it to retain some of that low end. 
I mean, he's way up high right there. You can see down there. I don't know the exact notes. Something like that. I love that harmony. Love the way they stack this. Somebody can do that high one. Pickerty third. Whoa. Okay, they end on that major chord. There's never been an E major played in this song. It's, again, it's very focused around E minor. Talked about this in a previous video as well. A Picardy third, I think this dates back to the Renaissance period, as I said, where it was kind of taboo to end on a minor key. So this is still used in modern music. It's just a kind of a knee-jerk tonal change that has some effectiveness, especially when you end a song that way. You can kind of hear that right here. But normally should go to... Instead, it's really cool. Let's see what this ending's about. They're going to shred it. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah, they're going for it. <laughs> That's cool. Wow. That was killer. Well, that was an epic performance with returns of old Yes members merging, bringing it back. I guess it's more of like a reunion. It was called the Union Tour, the Union Album. I don't know all the history with the fallouts and such, but this was a really cool moment to see. All these guys playing together, Bill Bruford and Alan White on drums, Rick Wakeman with uh, Tony, the previous keyboard player, who was fired right before Fragile was recorded. Very epic performance. Everything sounded great. And as I said at the beginning of this video, when I was in Scale of Summit, we played with Yes on two different occasions. We opened for them at Yestival, which is in 2013. It was a big six-band bill. And believe it or not, Valto was on the bill. If you don't know who that is, it's a side project by Danny Carey of Tool. That was my first time meeting him. Nicest guy ever. It was bizarre how down to earth and cool he was. And he was like a kid in the candy store being on the same bill as Yes, like, like more than me. And that was just, it showed me so much about Danny Carey. And if you want to see my videos on Tool, I've reacted to both Schism and The Pot. They're here on the channel. And then we later were joined, uh, asked to join the Cruise to the Edge, which was Yes's Cruise. And, you know, yes, we're getting older, and I kind of figured this might be my last time to see them live. I had coffee with Chris Squire. I shit you not, very briefly on the ship in a morning, because that's the cool thing about those music cruises, that you can kind of just intermingle with the bands whenever you see them. I told him how much of a fan I was, uh, how important his bass lines were to my influence, and kind of without that generation of music, I wouldn't even be on this cruise ship right now. And he nodded and said, very happy to hear that. I think they had a, a morning show or something, acoustic thing. Nonetheless, that was just a very special time in my life. So I have a very you know, soft spot in my heart for this band that uh, sought our band out for two different performances and personally invited us back after opening on the Yes Festival to now play on their cruise. So um, just something I'll never forget. Legendary band, and I'm happy to have checked out this performance. Thank you guys for watching. Please give this video a thumbs up. Comment any more Chris Squire songs and bass lines I should analyze. There's so much of Yes's discography I've really not unearthed. There's a lot of it I have, but they have such a wide breadth of stuff, like a lot of bands who've been around 50 years, right? And please subscribe to the channel, and we will see you next week. Cheers.